patterns of activity were well defined. And uh, significant contributions were made by our research group, which Now, the applications research, I shall focus only on the biological applications. Now, I'll cut this long story short. How we went about it, we changed the various R groups, there several ways of altering the R groups on tin. We changed the X groups, functionalized acetates, all these things. And originally it was thought that only the R groups in, uh, affected the toxicity, but we were the first to show that even variation in the X group do affect the toxicity. The, what is the reason for doing this? We're looking for industrial biocide application, crop protectants, uh, oil palm, rubber, pepper, cocoa, cruciferous vegetables, all these we looked at. Anti-tumor properties, we were looking at this. In order to look at all these, of course, we had to do some tests. And these are the tests that we did. Selective detoxic action, exportation, sublethal effects, and so on. And why insects develop toxicity and how to overcome that. Now this is a Ganoderma, the Ganoderma infection of oil palm. This is how Phytothora affects the cocoa and food rot in pepper. These are some, I won't focus too much on this, basically to show that sampling of the results, three phenyl groups, you put one, one chlorophenol group, the toxicity improves, you put more, it decreases. So these are what are called structure activity trends. Based on this, we were able to devise compounds. We are very selective in the toxic action. We looked at seed dressing studies, ground nuts for six months, uh, treated with organotin, they were viable to germination, developed healthy seedlings. Similarly, treated rice and maize seeds could be stored as seed dressing agents. The market is there. Test against wood, fungi, rubber wood is used extensively in furniture, but very susceptible to attack by sap stain and moles. We, we did some tests on rubber wood in, the, in a forest environment, put the stakes, rubber wood stakes on ground, above ground, below ground, and see whether they were affected by fungi, by insects, termites, and so on. Outstanding results were obtained. Now here is the untreated right treated with the commercial preservative center and uh, the patented organotin on the left. This is very clear of any attack, fungal attack or insect attack. Excellent. We then looked at studies on insects. When we, we picked this moth, the diamondback moth, Plutella xylostella, is a major worldwide pest of cruciferous vegetables, cauliflower, cabbage and so on. The most, it's not the moth itself, but it's the larvae, the third and fourth instar larvae, which are the most active. It has become resistant in Cameron Highlands. It resists to all major groups of insects, insecticides. So we looked at organotins, and we found that in many ways, organotins were more successful in any of these. It, it behaved like pesticide synergies allowing the, pe uh, the pesticide remain longer in the t insect to exert its tox toxic action. This is the larvae eating away. Now, one method by which insects develop resistance is through what is called the acetylcholine stress inhibitors. Now, many, most organotins have values in excess of one million. So everybody ignored organotins. Then we developed some compounds. You can see that. Where? This is 10 to the power of 6. This is 10 to the power of minus 5. How active they are. So it is a question of application. Structure activity relationships will show you, will get you compounds that they will do the trick. But putting putting chemicals in the environment, insect, we still need, the world still needs insecticides, pe pesticides, used herbicides, you still need. You cannot run away with that. You need them. But it's good if you can put less of this in the environment. So, means we are trying to exploit what is called the sublethal effects. 
Now this larvae that I just showed you just now, if I can prevent the larvae eating, that is anti feeding activity, without killing or repelling it, then you starve itself to death. That is a better way. So there is a there is a method. This is called as SC95, which is a starvation uh, control. There is for 95 percent starvation. We have done this with, with this uh, organotins, and at these levels, they have found we are very very effective. So we can use sublethal levels of organotins. You don't have to go to the LD50 values anymore. This another sublethal effect is a chemosterol inactivity against towards adult insect. Less eggs were laid. Some of the eggs laid would not hatch. So again, a chemosterol property was there. Excitement here in the toxicology world is here. Supplemental synergism. A number of things exhibited supplemental synergy when combined with a commercial insecticide. Could be Bacillus thuringiensis or Malathion. This is the toxicity index. And you get 4 to 20. Now people will get 1 to 3, they'll be happy, jumping up. We go 4 to 20. This particular compound there in yellow there has almost 20. This opens up a new role for organotins, a synergist insecticide resistance management because they directly inhibit the resistance mechanism in itself. So these are points to note that there are sublethal effects, excellent sublethal effects of organotins that you can apply in agriculture. Before we started with the diamondback moth, I went into looking at the Aedes aegypti because it causes the dengue fever. Now this is the mosquito. It has black and white stripes on its body. It's a good, it's a well-behaved mosquito because it bites only in the daytime. Now it carries with it a virus. This is how it looks like. It's a single strand of RNA. Ten proteins, three for the structure itself and seven more for creating more virons. The development of a dengue, dengue vaccine has proven difficult because there are four major subtypes of virus. There is a recent report in the paper, but two months ago I remember reading that some Australian scientists have uh, uh, treated mosquitoes with this bacteria, Wolbachia bacteria. The offsprings of these mosquitoes do not pick up the virus. Uh, perhaps I think my, my observation is, my feeling is that perhaps for suitable for deployment in large urban cities like Pitaling, Pitaling Jaya, Kuala Lumpur, but but over time, may lose effectiveness. I think the final answer is the best way to control mosquito populations is through eliminating breeding sites and the, insect, and the use of insecticides. So, what did we do? Uh, Prof. Yong Hoi Sen is not here. He was one of the, my early collaborators on this. We worked with the Liverpool red-eye strain as well as a local DDT tolerance strain of the mosquito. Of course, we worked with the Insta larvae. And these compounds showed excellent activity. And more important than that, not just the, the, the tritolaltin, in particular, very good 0.1 milligrams per liter level. But they showed high post-treatment mortality. What does that mean? That means to say you take the larvae out after treatment, put it into, into clean water, 24 hours after exposure, the larvae still die. That the post-treatment mortality, that means it continues to die. Then your high residual activity, that means you're using the insect solution, take the larvae out, and keep the same insect solution for 10 weeks and put in more larvae every 24 hours or whatever, take it out, and the, and the larvae, that means the solution does, uh, keeps its integrity. Now the important thing is, is if I can put all these, these sort of compounds into what I call slow release rubber pellets. You can put it in the, in the rice fields, you know, put the slow release rubber pellets and, and the tin compounds come out and, and kill the mosquitoes larvae. So there is an application here that can be done. We also looked at molluscs and bacteria, a number of tributyl tin, mixed butyl phenyl tins, very good, very effective against the 
this freshwater snail, Biomphalaria glabrata. This I did in conjunction with colleagues in, in, in the United Kingdom. Now this is, is a cause of the Bilharzia. Now this is very effective, it prevents, it kills the, kills the host of the Bilharzia. Kills the snail. Now tin compounds were also found to be fed against growth uh, against gram-positive and gram-negative pathogenic bacteria. I think some of my co-workers are here in this. This is E. coli, is a gram-negative bacteria. And, uh, and uh, what, 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 it was, what we showed was that uh, you can get bacillus subtilis here, positive. 100% inhibition, 90% inhibition against this. So both positive and negative gram-staining bacteria can be very effectively controlled. So if you can incorporate these organotin compounds into paints and uh, waxes and hospital floors and, and, and uh, hospital walls, maybe you can prevent cross-infection. So here you have something that can be applied at a, immediately. I think uh, we have not patented this, but uh, those compounds, similar compounds, do exist. The anti-tumor studies, uh, this is a, now we are almost to an end. We looked at this virus, Epstein-Barr virus, and also the murine leukemia in mice. Uh, now, Epstein-Barr virus is associated with the B cell lymphoma nasopharyngeal carcinoma, that's why our interest was there, Hodgkin's disease. It is, the, the, the virus itself has a, what is called a two cycles, biphasic infection cycle, it's a latent stage, nothing happens, and then is when it comes to alive, lytic replicative phase, that's when it uh, exerts its uh, effect. Now the, the uh, few points with regard to EBV, this Epstein-Barr virus, it affects only males, mostly. Females are somehow or the other have a protective mechanism. Uh, is a member of the herpes family, and uh, is and uh, uh, has been implicated. And in NPC actually is a squamous uh, cancer. Very prevalent in parts of East Asia, China, and that part, parts of Africa and it's primarily transmitted by saliva. The, the saliva and the cells replicate in what is called this, this area called oropharynx. They multiply there and then um, subsequently can infect, uh, uh, what do you call, um, recirculating B, B cell lymphocytes. So they remain in the B cell lymphocytes in a very late, latent state. And then when it comes to the lytic cycle, the excess toxic action. Now unlike the other, other, other virus, this is the DNA. You can see it's a nucleocaspid there. And there's another envelope of, protein envelope outside. And uh, let me go back to this one. So what we did was we, we tested against uh, Raji cells, which were found, which uh, we made sure that they contained EBV DNA. So these Raji cells were effectively controlled by our organotins, similarly the PTDDA cells. Now the activation of EBV from latency to lytic cycle is triggered by several cycles here. Uh, the stage expression of viral proteins including the early antigen complex and we looked at the early antigen complex in our studies and we found that uh, when the when when the raji cells were incubated with the organotin compounds and tumor promoters and all that